Away. So let's get going with our uh, first speaker this afternoon, Julia DeFabo from Art UK. Um, in spring 2020, Art UK began the online art exchange hashtag on Twitter in order to encourage a sense of community across the glam sector. Uh, Julia is Art UK social media manager, and she's going to be discussing now how the online art exchange has grown since that point and how participation has widened uh, with more than 5,000 tweets to date using that hashtag. So, uh, Julia, um, please take it away. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, just a brief visual description myself. I have brown shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a white linen shirt on this very hot day. Um, in case you're not familiar with Art UK, we're a cultural education charity and we partner with over 3,000 public museums and galleries and art collections across the UK to digitize the artworks that are in their collections. We bring the UK's public art together in one place for everyone to explore and enjoy online. Um, and I'm the social media manager for Art UK. And one of the things that we started during lockdown in the spring of 2020 was the online art exchange. Um, and this was when museums and galleries were closed to the public. People really were thirsty for culture. And initially we hosted a series of regional days to virtually exchange artworks. So we asked institutions to engage with one another by sharing artworks from other collections in their regions. Um, so institutions used Art UK to find the artworks from other institutions. And the idea was and still is to foster a sense of community among the sector and to bring museums together in an informal way. An overwhelming response from the institutions involved led to the expansion of the online art exchange. And now there's a theme each Thursday and institutions, curators, and even some members of the public participate. It's a really fun, lighthearted way to engage with the Art UK's digital database of artworks. And the lighthearted tone of the campaign is intended to make more art more approachable to a general audience. Um, so for example, you don't need to be an art historian to have an opinion on the purpliest purple artwork or to share a purple artwork that you love. Um, and this is just a, a quick scroll through of a recent online art exchange so you can get an idea of what it looks like um, going across the screen. It's just a Twitter feed of different museums sharing images with the online art exchange hashtag. <clears throat> the sense of the of community is really at the heart of all of it. Um, I really love this quote from the National Galleries of Scotland who said that they've discovered new galleries and museums on Twitter who they wouldn't have otherwise followed. Um, and that's reflected in the numbers actually. So since 2020, as Stephen said, there have been over 5,200 online art exchange tweets. Um, and also there have been around 195 tweets per month in the last 18 months using the hashtag. Um, I believe these are really estimate, uh, really conservative estimates. Um, so if you at all work in social media, you know that Twitter makes it really difficult to count hashtags. Um, and so if you want to know how I got there, I can tell you about that later. Um, you can ask me it on the side. Um, this chart shows the estimated number of tweets using the hashtag per month in the past 18 months. Um, the orange bars, which is January 2021 to April 2021, represent the months in, months in which museums and galleries were closed to visitors for at least part of the month. Um, so engagement was really high online during that time. You can see that there was a little bit of a dip in the winter of this past year, but use of the hashtag is picking up again. We averaged 20% more impressions um, on our UK's Twitter account, meaning times that our tweets are viewed on online art exchange days compared to other days of the week. And we're not alone in this increased impressions and engagement numbers. Um, the institutions who participate in the online art exchange also see more impressions and more engagement on their tweets compared to on online art exchange days compared to other days. So Kettles Yard in Cambridge noted that their online art exchange tweets are consistently in their top 10 tweets each month. And Victoria Art Gallery and Museum in Liverpool reached more than double their usual audience with art, online art exchange tweets during lockdown. Um, and they say that this reach is still 25% above other Twitter content now that people are going offline more. Part of the success of the online art exchange is just how many institutions participate. So there's a really great geographical spread reflected in those who participate from the Pierre Arts Center in Orkney to Naughton Gallery at uh, Queen's University Belfast to Penley House and Gallery Museum in Penzance. There's also a really wonderful spread of collection size from more local museums, such as the Cooper Gallery in Barnsley, 
to trusts who care for multiple museums and galleries, such as Culture Perth and Kinross, to some of the nation's largest museums, such as the National Portrait Gallery. Like many organizations, resourcing is the main challenge that we face with this campaign. Um, we send the themes out ahead of time to the most active collections and to those who have requested it. And while it takes time to send individual messages rather than a group message, um, this is really what's helped us to have a really successful campaign. Um, it's helped us to build a community and to build trust. They know I'm a real person and, I'm, and many of them know me by first name. I know them by first name too. Um, so this is, this is really actually a, a plus, even though it's a challenge. Um, and also I spend the entire day managing the online art exchange each week. We attempt to retweet and comment on any post that use the hashtag. This helps the post to be seen and is the reason why so many institutions see such high engagement on their online art exchange posts. More people commenting on a post pushes it up and the algorithm especially likes when two verified accounts or two accounts with blue ticks talk to each other. So it's kind of playing on knowing what, um, you know, what the algorithm likes as well. And this is a scroll through showing just how we commented on um, a post and then someone else commented on it too. And it created a really nice conversation online, um, which in addition to being really great and pushing the content up, it's also just creating more of a sense of community. We're also making sure that the campaign stays relevant and doesn't seem too repetitive or stale. So um, we're countering um, kind of that challenge of it becoming repetitive or stale with the way we choose our themes. Um, this chart shows the top 10 themes from the past 18 months. And the ones in orange, again, are the ones that happened during lockdown when, people, when engagement was high. Overall, we can see that holiday themes do well, such as Valentine's Day. Colors do, colors do well, such as best blues. And art genres do well, such as still life and sculpture. Um, also in the future, we want to do more collaborations. So, Upcoming in October, um, we've partnered with Worcester Museums and their Canaletto exhibition. We're going to have a theme on canals and waterways. And in addition to being a great collaboration, it reflects Art UK, one of Art UK's key aims of supporting collections. And finally, we can use the network we've built to run other campaigns and also to support museums and their campaigns. Um, for example, a museum came to me just last week and asked if I could pass on information about a Twitter hashtag um, that they were running um, to another museum. And this to me is a huge success. Um, museums know that we've created this community and they can tap into this community as a resource. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this quote from the Fitzwilliam Museum that just, they're talking about how great it is to say hello to other collections on the online art exchange and to meet them. And if your institution doesn't already join in on the fun on Thursdays, I hope that they do. Um, thanks. Thank you very much, Julia. That was uh, that was terrific, and I'm I'll certainly be following that hashtag in future. Our next speaker is Laurie Podolsky, who is a doctoral student at McGill University. Um, Laurie is going to be talking this afternoon about uh, her work to research the impact of digitization standards on uh, cultural values and uh, and the attributes of marginalized communities, in particular the way that archivists. Um, are still working towards linking technology and standards towards power relationships and colonialism. I mean, this is a very interesting subject and, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this one. So uh, please take it away, Laurie. Thank you, Stephen. I'm just gonna take a minute and share my screen as well. Um, so I am, I've got blonde hair tied back. Uh, I don't know if you can see the blue shirt or not, but if you can, I've got a blue shirt on and glasses. So that's the big thing for me too. So again, thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for attending this session and to the our presenters for sharing the project. I'm really enjoying this very much. And um, just wanted to say my PhD research, as Stephen was mentioning, focuses on cultural values or biases in digitization standards. In this presentation, I will look at four important concepts and their definitions provide an example of the relationship between cultural values and techno technological fit and use, talk about my research questions and themes, and highlight some of the impacts of my work. So to frame my research, I'd like to introduce four key terms, culture, 
misrecognition, adhere country context, and context sensitive. For my research, I am adopting Equiland and Okafor's definition of culture as shared arts, beliefs, customs, institutions, inventions, language, technology, and values. In this definition, culture and technology become linked. RISM defines misrecognition as the notion of Western models or strategies shaping or influencing other cultures in which the features or characteristics of a standard replicate the values of the dominant society. The reliance on Western models does not always address the needs of non-Western nations or institutions, nor do the Western models fit into unique processes. Bayesa, Kitma, and Berna Howe use the term adhere country context in their institutional readiness survey for the development of a national digitization standard. Adhere country context implies that the technical processes of digitization should comply with the milieu of the country and its needs through a socio-technical -techn approach. Oren Bao's context sensitive is very similar to the adhere country context. And the context sensitive is a solution as well as a strategy. Context sensitive approaches must meet the needs of each nation to ensure that both social and technological aspects of digitization are taken into account. My research identifies a gap in the archival field in which standards are connected to power relationships and the standards are inseparable from their cultural context. Many archives implement Western digitization standards and these standards have the potential to influence or replace the cultural values of non-Western countries. In this effect, in effect, this further creates or deepens inequalities between nations, and in some cases, acts as forms of dominance and colonization. Implement uh, the use of, use of and reliance on Western standards impacts non-Western countries' abilities to overcome the dominant values embedded in digitization standards. Non-Western countries face a technological environment that is biased against their unique needs to culturally manage their materials. Con um, the loss of cultural distinctiveness may be due to the conflict between cultural values and the standards. In addition, the lack of a context-sensitive approach is connected to underlying issues of technological fit with a country's values, and this leads to misrecognition. By incorporating cultural values, only then can discriminatory designs become context sensitive and the technological fit more successful. So the existing literature defines common challenges such as poor infrastructure, lack of financial resources, lack of staff skill set and training, lack of equipment and ineffective policy development. One part of my research attempts to identify what other challenges exist and if these challenges could be considered as cultural values. Another research question incorporates misrecognition and the ways in which digitization standards replicate Western values and whether these values cause the loss of cultural distinctiveness in non-Western countries. In addition to an additional research question looks at the technological conflict that arises between technological fit and cultural values. The question examines how technological conflict is indicated and how low technological adoption and unsustainable standards form part of the technological conflict. So there's a link on this um, slide. It's makuto.org, M-U-K-U-R-T-O. And Makuto is a grassroots project that works to empower communities to manage, share, and exchange their digital heritage. The organization provides space for multiple cultural narratives, traditional knowledge, and diverse protocols to support cultural values making it a good example of a context-sensitive approach and illustrates the relevance of technology, dominance, and power in archives. Comparing the metadata element creator, for instance, illustrates the importance of cultural values between Makuto metadata schema and the Dublin Core Standard. Makuto retains indigenous distinctiveness and redefines the element to encompass the person, organization, clan, tribe, or cultural group who creates or also provides the essential knowledge or labor for a heritage object. The Dublin Core Standard only acknowledges or records the person, organization, or service that makes or creates the object and does not take into account the importance of those who provide the knowledge or labor. 
since the Dublin Core Standard does not include Indigenous cultural values on the person providing the knowledge or labor, this standard lacks the necessary cultural context and erodes Indigenous distinctive, distinctiveness and leads to colonization. Technology such as digitization standards and programs form a, forms a tool of representation and racism in archives. The technology embodies and is embedded with Western dominant cultural values that are expressed through misrecognition. In this sense, technology has cultural biases that exclude others or override marginalized societal society's values. The conflict of values becomes important when understanding the relationships between technological adoption and colonization. In archival power relationships, technology can be used to further marginalize communities by creating new or overriding existing cultural values. In this context, technology acts as an expression of the Western or dominant culture and can, there, and can reinforce biases and power relationships. So thank you very much. And I would love to hear your feedback or comments. So please feel free to email. And my email is on the screen as well laurie.podolsky at mail.mcgill.ca. Thanks again. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Laurie. That was excellent. I hope as well as getting in touch with Laurie, there might be some good questions for her at the end of this uh, session this afternoon. Our next speaker is uh, Christiane Davila from um, the uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. And um, She's going to be talking to us about the Young Scientist Against Epidemics digital game, which was an initiative to uh, increase awareness amongst the public, particularly amongst young people, uh, about the uh, history of combating um, outbreaks of disease and illness and uh, the role of Oswaldo Cruz in uh, fighting epidemics in Rio de Janeiro. So um, I think this is going to be a really interesting one as well. It's going in a very different direction. So uh, Christiane, please um, give us your talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing a white shirt, have brown hair and using glasses. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. First, I would like to thank, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I am a communication advisor at Fundação João de Cruz, an important public health institution in Latin America, located in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I work with scientific dissemination, especially in projects for the diffusion of Fiocruz Historical Archive. Uh, it is the largest documentary collection on the history of science and health in Brazil. Um, yes. Uh, this is the building of Rio Cruz and uh, Ipanema Beach in Rio de Janeiro. Um, well, in 2020, uh, as we were placed in remote work, we had the challenge of organizing an activity to publicize the historical archive for the National Science and Technology Week, a national event in which Phil Cruz is one of the participants. We needed to think of a solution. This is our event in uh, 2019. That's when I uh, that's when I read about the work uh, of a history teacher who had made a digital game with gamification strategy in Google Forms, in which each step is a challenge for the player to advance. Uh, the idea was not to create a quiz with right or wrong answers for a scoring, but to teach and encourage the user to move forward learning. As we were living through an unprecedented pandemic, we decided to use an emblematic episode in the history of Brazilian science 
which has Osvaldo Cruz, the founder of my institution, as the protagonist to script the game. The proposal was to make the player a young scientist against epidemic. As an assistant to Osvaldo Cruz, he or she is invited to help the doctor fight epidemics of bubonic plague, yellow fever, and smallpox in the years 1903 and 1904 in Rio de Janeiro and participate in important decisions to avoid thousands of deaths. The script was elaborated from research on historical archive photos, academical articles, books, and websites. The work included text production, research and writing, and design visual programming. The game was divided into three phases with two themes per phase at a total of six questions. If she or he got the historical question right, he or she would win a prize. If didn't choose what actually happened at that time, he or she would gain an incentive to improve. In other words, he or she won anyway. The proposal was to entertain, teach, maintain interest, and make the user move forward. We played with concepts so that the experience would show that it is necessary to learn from the past, but to analyze the issues in the light of the time in which they happened. The experience was very gratifying. There were more than 1,380 participants in one year, in one year, most of whom were students aged between 11 and 20 years old. More than 760 left their contact email, which generated an important mailing list for future scientific dissemination actions for this audience. It was the first digital educational activity in the historical archive. The success of the game may, made it one of the activities selected by few crews to compose the institution's stand at Expo Dubai 2022. That is it. Thank you very much. And uh, my email, cristiane.davila, arroba, Fiocruz, and uh, the email of the, the designer who made the game with me, and the QR code for the, the game, if you are interest, interest, if you have interest in seeing this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christiane. And uh, just to remind everybody that uh, this session is being recorded, so if you need to follow up on things like email addresses and QR codes, you will be able to find them through the recording in Feedloop um later on that was really interesting christian thank you very much i love thank um, you very much uh i love that that project was a response to the pandemic both uh in terms of topic and both thematically and practically it was something that could be done uh whilst everyone's in lockdown that's really interesting uh thank you. thank you so our next uh speaker is carly wanner hyde from uh, greenhouse studios which is part of the university of connecticut it's a DH Research Incubation Studio, and uh, Cardi's going to be talking to us this afternoon about the uh, web app Sorcery and some work that's been ongoing to uh, improve and enhance it. So, um, Carly, please um, tell us more about Sorcery. Yes, absolutely. So is everyone able to see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Let me just switch you. Okay, great. So hi everyone, and thank you so much for attending this lightning talk. It's it's really been wonderful to hear the presentations of my colleagues, and I'm honored to be presenting alongside them. And thank you to everybody at DCDC making this possible. Like as introduced, my name is Carly Wannerhide. I am a woman with longish brown hair and a white linen shirt. I use she/they pronouns, and I'm really looking forward to telling you all about Sorcery, a project out of Greenhouse Studios 
like uh, like Steve said, at the University of Connecticut Library. So to start, let me tell you a little bit about Greenhouse Studios. So we are a digital humanities research incubation studio, and we work across disciplines to create engaging and innovative ways to share research, whether that be in addition to or in lieu of a traditional research paper. My role there is as a design technologist, and I am also the project lead and UI UX designer for Sorcery. So some examples of project mediums that we've used at Greenhouse are VR and AR experiences, 2D animations, podcasts, ArcGIS, just to name a few. And some of the project topics we've done have explored Christian political tribalism, the history and examination of Yukon as a land grant institution, adult perceptions of children's roles in history and culture, um, and a recreation of the coronation of King Charles V, just to name a few of what we've done. And then uh, we have sorcery, of course. So I'll tell you about that in a second, but the sorcery team is made up of our PI team, our testing partners and our developing team. And it was really important for us to make sure that this team reflects the target user groups. So we're made up of historians, researchers, archivists, and librarians and have testing partners that are both public and private academic institutions and libraries. But let me tell you a little bit about more, uh, a little bit more about sorcery, uh, what we've learned through the pandemic, what the app is and where we see it fitting in. So as you may have noticed, our lives have drastically shifted over the pandemic, especially in the spheres of research and accessibility. So these last two years have really reinforced trends, problems and issues that we already knew existed but have made them even more salient. And here are those issues that we've kind of identified. The pace of discovery is outpacing the speed of high quality digitization, which is really exciting, but something to think about. Uh, we have an increased need for integrated in-person and online research and request workflows, and the importance of global accessibility to archival documents, especially those that aren't digitized. As we reflected on these issues, we've arrived at the conclusion that in order to alleviate some of these roadblocks, what we need is an improved research infrastructure. So as we've continued the development of sorcery from pre-pandemic until now, we've grown to make sure that the app we are building is dynamic, flexible, and scalable so that it may be a tool for both user ends. That's great. So what is sorcery and who are these users exactly? So sorcery just launched this year. Uh, it is a nonprofit open access mobile web app that is accessible on any device connected to the internet and it connects researchers with partnered institutions to streamline the reference scan request workflow for undigitized archival documents on a single intuitive interface. So our users are requesters on one side, and these might be researchers, historians, students, folks interested in their genealogy, et cetera. And then we have fulfillers at our partnered institutions. And these people could be archivists, librarians, or perhaps even students or employees working at these repositories. And we wanted to create an app that, like I said earlier, is a tool effective on both user ends. So what are some of its uses and, and ways it can be implemented? So we want to provide archivists, librarians, and institutions with a few different tools, such as a streamlined reference scanning and fulfillment workflow, customizable payment processing scans through Stripe, if an institution chooses to charge for reference scans, and rich usage analytics, such as the number of requests over a given time, the approximate geographic location of requesters, average file size, and more, just to name a few. For smaller institutions, Sorcery may function as an organizational tool to delegate and keep track of new in progress and completed requests, as well as digitize and catalog material at a reference scan quality through our integrations I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, without needing expensive technology or excessive amounts of time. We hope to help these smaller institutions increase both their accessibility and visibility, while also providing tools that may help in reporting repository usage, whether that be in yearly reports or grants, while keeping it financially accessible. Additionally, Sorcery has an in-app per request communication feature to allow questions, clarifications, and even links to be shared. So on the requester side, they have a single interface where they can access all partnered institutions through one login portal, they can keep track of the requests on their user dashboard and communicate with archives through the messaging feature. One of our other goals was to provide a way to reduce travel costs, time constraints, and financial barriers for requesters while they research a topic. And Sorcery provides them with a way to see the thing or things before deciding if they want to make an extended trip to a repository. So here's how it works. A requester selects the institution they wish to request from, then input any information they ha may have into the request field, such as a box or folder number, 
or a full citation if they have it, then hit submit. However, they don't need a full citation to make requests, so there can be some back and forth between the requester and the fulfiller. To complete a request, the fulfiller can either take a picture directly in the app with a smartphone or tablet, upload a JPEG, PDF, PNG file, and additional from their computer, or if the article has already been digitized and cataloged, they can send a link. Additionally, they can add corrected citations or metadata to each item if they wish to include this information. Then once the request has been completed, both the requester and fulfiller will receive a receipt containing the message thread, original citations, corrected citations and metadata if added, and the documents for download. So we have some things that are coming up that we're really looking forward to. So some of these app integrations like I was talking about uh, with apps such as Archive Space, Tropy, Omeka, Fedora, and Islandora, so that we can support a more cohesive experience in the reference scan request fulfillment workflow. And then we were also developing native iOS and Android apps, as well as a low bandwidth uh, version of the app that will be released in 2023, especially for researchers with limited access to the internet, such as in the global south. So by providing a streamlined infrastructure and tools for improved organization and communication, we aim to make the reference scan request process more manageable for archivists and vastly increase access for researchers around the world. We are actively looking for institutions to join Sorcery's growing network. So if Sorcery sounds like a tool that would benefit your institution or you as a researcher, please reach out to me at carly at uconn.edu. We can set up an informational meeting, answer any questions, and get started seeing how the app may integrate into your workflow. Thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you to the folks running the conference and planning such a great event. And I really look forward to connecting with all of you more. Thank you very much, Carly. That was another terrific and, uh, um, again, really varied uh, um, talk, which is um, really kind of adding to the diversity of topics in this session this afternoon. That was really, really interesting and um, quite a fascinating look at producing something with, you know, very specific uh, sort of goals in mind. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rafi Cecilia from University College London. Uh, Rafi is a research fellow at UCL and uh, also an access and inclusion consultant who provides services around audience research and public engagement advice for museums and cultural institutions. Um, she's passionate about improving the experience of disabled visitors through digital innovation and the use of assistive technology. And uh, she's gonna be talking to us this afternoon about new opportunities for visually impaired museum visitors. Um, so, um, Rafi, please let us uh, let's hear your talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you for the lovely introduction. So, a very quick visual description. I am a young woman with longish hair, uh, brown, blondish, a bit big, um, wearing a grey, bluish t-shirt, and um, I. Today, I'm going to be talking about post-pandemic opportunities for visually impaired museum visitors. Um, I apologize in advance if I'm not going to be able to describe all of the images, but if anybody needs um, a description, I will provide it. So, so please uh, make sure you reach out to me and I will do that. So, so um, my PhD research look at the experience of blind and partially sighted people in museums. So, during and after the first lockdown in the UK, after I finished my PhD, I reached out to participants for my PhD project to try and understand how the pandemic had changed their perspectives and more important, the way they used museums. What we need to bear in mind um, is that inequality issues have worsened. Disabled people are currently struggling to access healthcare treatment they require, experiencing higher rates and more severe mental health issues. Um, experiencing more severe economic issues, um, worse isolation, and even lesser participation compared to non-disabled people. So it is imperative to look at how the pandemic is and will be affecting um, also the opportunities that disabled people will have to take part in cultural and social activities. While that might seem minor compared to like financial and health issues, it has been proven in the past decade or so um, that participation in cultural and social activities has an incredible beneficial effect on the life of disabled visitors, museum visitors. 
So when we think about uh, museums uh, in the post-pandemic world, uh, um, is the pandemic going to represent uh, a new barrier or a new opportunity for disabled people? So obviously the pandemic is having a severe impact on museums on many different levels, but the current crisis has also opened up conversations about access to museum collections, not just physically, but also digitally. We have witnessed uh, a true revolution and a very fast revolution in the way museums have engaged audiences online and the way they have created digital opportunities of participation and the way they also have translated collections and exhibitions into digital formats during the lockdowns. The pandemic is having a direct effect on the way disabled people access physical museum spaces, but most important, digital museum experiences. So on the one hand, we are witnessing a very negative impact uh, due to navigation restrictions, new physical barriers, the difficulty to maintain social distancing, uh, new regulations like the use of masks, uh, which cannot be uh, always used by everyone, or the lack of tactile opportunities, the impossibility to touch objects on display, the lack of dedicated assistance uh, in the physical museum space. However, on the other hand, uh, reports of positive experiences uh, have continued to arise uh, due to the increasing possibility to socialize and to participate in cultural opportunities from home, overcoming physical access barriers, but also due to a renowned empathy towards disabled people, as non-disabled people had a taste for the very first time of several restrictions that are part of disabled people's daily practices, and they were part of their lives before the pandemic. Um, on the slide, there's some examples of uh, very engaging online opportunities for non-disabled museum visitors and disabled museum visitors. There's the BBC Culture in Quarantine, Museum from Home, um, Enjoy Art Wherever You Are, and um, as Julia has uh, uh, spoken about like a couple of like minutes ago, uh, the Art UK online art exchange hashtag. So what I asked was like, what does it mean for visually impaired people and in general disabled people to participate in digital and remote experiences of art and culture and what it meant during the pandemic? The response has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, Susan, one participant said, I just love being able to listen to curators talking about exhibitions online. It's a dream. Susan complained when she participated in my PhD that she had to go to the physical space in the museum space and that was a very distressing experience for her, but the online contact was not enough to satiate her thirst for knowledge. Davide was very enthusiastic about uh, museums engaging with um, technology, uh, VR features, 3D technology, gaming, um, he considered it a very positive um, innovation. And Anna uh, spoke about how it was really helpful for her to engage with museums online during the pandemic to take her mind off. And while she complains that accessibility wasn't always great, uh, she really enjoyed um, she really enjoyed being able to access content. Um, the pandemic and the long sense of uncertainty bring the risk to wipe off the independence and the confidence that experienced blind and partially sighted visitors had developed before the pandemic. But even more worryingly, they could potentially create huge barriers that could definitely discourage empower, less empowered disabled people, um, which museums were already struggling to appeal to. Digital innovation is the way to reach out to these people and the way to make them understand that the museum space is a space for them as well. How to do that? Um, a lot of museums after the pandemic have started conversation about access, equality and inclusion, and they're started to seek to speak to disabled visitors. And they figure institutions do it in different ways. Uh, some reach out to charities, some do it uh, through social media engagement, some collaborate with academics like me, some organize workshops, focus groups, and so on. Um, what is important, uh, uh, the three things that I think um, is important at this stage is to make sure that collaborators, museum collaborators share the same commitment to equality inclusion, um, that museums are ready to compensate disabled people for their time and expertise, um, that they are transparent, and uh, even more important, that museums do not waste time when speaking to disabled visitors. Museums need to be prepared to radically change their practice and innovate 
to make sure to offer equal and empowering opportunities. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephen. I think I've kept some time. Thank you very much, Rafi. That was uh, excellent. That was the last uh, of our speed presentations and they were all uh, superb. I think um, one of the drawbacks of having a conference in this format, and there are many, many advantages, such as the fact that I, I can do it whilst wearing slippers. Um, but one of the disadvantages is that uh, um, I don't think our speakers can hear the, the, the applause that um, they would normally hear at the end of a, a session like this. But I'm in no doubt whatsoever that, um, that there is a kind of huge amount of appreciation and, and lots and lots of uh, mental applause for that set of really, really good conversations. And, and presentations. So could I ask our speakers to um, put their cameras and mics back on and we'll take a look at uh, some questions and answers. I've got some questions because um, I found all of those sessions really, really interesting and, and um, lots to talk about. But I do notice we have one in the Q&A from uh, Nikki Thorpe, which was addressed to Christiane. Now, Christiane, I know uh, that you answered that in writing, but if I uh, just read out Nikki's question, and I wonder if you would mind answering it um, in the in the Zoom call, so we could get it into the recording and, and so everybody can have a chance to hear. So the question from Nikki to Christiane was: uh, Did you have young people as advisors as the game was built and designed? I, that is Nikki, uh, works with students in a school as part of a young archivist group, and would love to engage them in creating something in a similar way that reflects school history. So um, Christiania, please tell us about your, um, uh, your kind of experience in that area. I think you're still on mute, Christiane. Uh, thank you. We didn't have any help uh, of students because we were at remote work. And we had to uh, think of a solution uh, for the, the uh, our um, uh, National Science and Technology Week. And as we uh, heard about this, this game in Google Forms, we decided to use our photographs uh, to, to uh, explain how can you uh, help and a scientist, man, the students would be very interested in, in understand how uh, uh, a scientist um, fights against an epidemic. We had the, the experience in Brazil in, in, in 20th century, 1903, 1904, we had uh, epidemics of uh, smallpox and yellow fever, and um, and uh, okay. uh, bubonic plague, <laughs> and we had uh, we, uh, we used this to to uh, made this game for the the students, and I think that it was very interesting and in our experience. If you were to do uh, more um, projects like this, Christian, do you think you would uh, be keen to involve students in the development process? Yes, I, I, we, we didn't have the opportunity to uh, make contact with schools mm -hmm. uh, in Rio de Janeiro. We, we made this game for the, the event, the, the National Week, of science and technology week, but we, we didn't have the opportunity to talk with uh, uh, teachers and and students. I think that uh, it would be very important if uh, uh, we could uh, work with this public, uh, but uh, we didn't have this opportunity. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry, my English is not very. <laughs> I fluent. don't think I don't think we have any problem with your English today, Christian. Thank you. That was really, uh -huh. really, really clear presentation, and a really, really clear answer. 
Um, it has kind of sparked a question in me, I mean, in that sort of topic of uh, audience engagement. Um, and just thinking about the, the, the last talk from Rafi, um, you know, you spoke, you know, very clearly, Rafi, about the importance of um, involving disabled users in any kind of consultation and, and planning about uh, um, expanding services and, and uh, accessibility um, for them. Um, but there are, you know, there are different levels of, of uh, institution and different kind of scales of operation. Do you have any, um, any thoughts on how smaller institutions can, uh, can involve, you know, maybe institutions with smaller budgets and, and kind of less, uh, less resourcing to throw at this type of activity, how they can be sure to involve uh, their audience in this development work? Thank you, Stephen. So I think the most important thing to say about this is that uh, not involving disabled people from the beginning of the decision making process and consultation um, ends up being more expensive than actually um, involving them at the end, even when the budget is very limited. Um, often, uh, especially when collaborating with external companies uh, that might not necessarily have the same commitment to access and inclusion as the museums, uh, the risk is to end up with a product that uh, um, ends up being discriminatory in the space and ends like then correcting it becomes incredibly expensive. Uh, not correcting it is not an option. Um, having said that, uh, obviously working with larger institutions that have significant more funding is easier because um, compensation is a lot easier to advocate for compensation of the expertise. I do believe that it's we're way past the time to ask people to collaborate and to bring in their expertise for free, even when the budget is limited. Um, in re specific response to your question, I think there's ways of compensating uh, people for their expertise in different ways. It could be uh, a membership to the museum. It could be special tours of the exhibition. Museums can be creative if the budget is limited. Uh, they can offer uh, perhaps um, a lunch in the cafe. They can offer a private tour, a special tour for them and members of their family by a curator, by a museum director, by a conservator, a look at behind the scenes. Um, what I think it's important is if the money is there, if the budget is there, people need to be compensated. If the money is not there, the community is often very happy to help to provide better experiences as long as there is some sort of compensation, even if it needs to be creative. Thank you, Raffa. That's a terrific answer. And I really like the idea of uh... Of institutions being yes being created with how they how they kind of reward and, and compensate people um do i mean it's still not too late if you have a question to pop it into the q a for our panel this afternoon otherwise i'll keep going because i've got a tell me oh we're fantastic instead of listening to me well you still have to listen to me but we can uh we have a question from elizabeth fulton for uh julia who asks if uh you've noticed more uh, uh, and more similar campaigns such as online art exchange uh, occurring since you began using the hashtag. So has it, do you think perhaps it's inspired some um, similar activities? Um, I'm, I'm not sure which ones have come first. Um, I know it was all during lockdown that, for example, um, York Museum started the curator battle, which is really good fun. Um, and part of the fun of the curator battle too is you kind of know the day before what it's going to be and it's really a lighthearted tone and it's and it's institutions involved again museums involved um, and they say you know give us your weirdest shoe um, so their their themes are really off the wall really really fun a slightly different approach to ours but I think it, it works as well and it, it creates a community um, Another organization that's that's done something that's kind of this other kind of hashtag campaign that started during lockdown was the Royal Academy did the RA Daily Doodle um, and it's now the RA Friday Doodle. So every Friday um, someone someone comes in, uh, some, they come up with a, a theme and say, you know, I think they had one recently it was like draw a helpful giraffe. So again, really fun and lighthearted. Um, and they, they said while engagement started to, I, I spoke to the um, RA team, and they said while engagement started to dip, that's why they started to do it just on Fridays instead of every day. But they have a really dedicated, really great group of 
sketchers who always, always um, comment on it and get involved. And so I guess that's the thing is even when you're seeing, you know, possibly engagement dipping um, as people are going more offline, especially in the summer when people are on summer holidays, you're still building a community. And when you have a dedicated community, it's really great to have a way to to kind of keep keep that community together. Um, yeah. And there's actually another part to Elizabeth's question, which is, um, do you think that other organizations are keen to put their collections online now that they've seen the success of online art exchange? I think so. I mean, as our UK um, partners with over 3,200 institutions across the UK, um, so th those collections are all available on artuk.org, um, which is absolutely incredible. As far as I know, the UK is the only country that has this kind of massive database of artworks. Um, and I would I would love to see it happen in other countries. Um, I, I'm American, I'd love to see every US museum put their artworks online. Um, I know it's really helpful for, not just for the community to see artworks and get used to seeing them and say, you know, I belong in a museum because I, I've seen this artwork on TikTok. Um, it's, it's a place for me, um, but it's also really helpful to researchers um, to say, okay, well, where's every, I don't know, um, Barbara Hepworth sculpture in the UK and suddenly you type it in and you have the whole list. Um, so yeah, I, 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 think that, I think that in the UK, the museums have definitely been really, really positive um, for Art UK and I, I do hope to see that elsewhere. Terrific. We have a question in the chat from, from Rafi, I think. So Rafi, do you want to ask? Julia, that question for the... Uh, for yeah, the I was, um, I followed the online art exchange uh, uh, hashtag a lot, and um, I really liked that it was very open and accessible from the beginning, encouraging users to use like accessibility features. And I was wondering if something is being done at the moment to encourage users to use all text to add descriptions for images. I think that's a really great idea, Rafi. And I think that when I, um, that's something I'm going to take on board from your talk. When I when I send out the themes to all of our um, partner organizations, I'll ask them to start including alt text um, if they aren't already. I know a lot of them do. Um, but yeah, I, I also know that a lot of people, when they respond quickly, don't, don't always use alt text. So I think it's just making that part of the practice rather than making that an additional thing that we have to do. Like, oh, if we have time, it's just, no, that's part of posting. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely suggest that to our partner collections when I send out the next set of themes. Awesome, um, thank you, Julia. And um, thank you for that question, Rafi. Let's see if we've got any other open questions or anything sitting in the chat. No, I have a question for, for Laurie. Um, Laurie, again, thank you once again for your talk. It was really interesting and I was really, um, struck by the failure to um, to always in the past treat technology as, a, as an artifact of culture and, and the kind of you know the downstream problems from doing that but just looking at your research in general um, you're uh, you're looking at the um, the problems um, caused by you know technology and uh, as a kind of as a sort of mechanism of of power and, and and colonialism um what do you hope will be the uh the sort of outcomes from your work and and um, what is the sort of applicability to other fields and, and disciplines of what you're doing thanks Stephen. i'm glad you enjoyed it and i enjoyed talking about it so one of the outcomes that i'm looking at is um being able to bring in awareness like um especially in the archival field uh, we talk about, um, you know, how we might acquire things, uh, acquire collections and phone and stuff like that. And we also talk about a lot on the silences that are in archives, like the, the papers that we don't collect. Um, so we have those kind of two. And um, when we go to work with collections, like the technology that we use, like in digitization standards, specific like making them accessible the kinds of catalogs that we use um the metadata standards so if we're using um access to memory the atom catalog as a way of putting a funding aid um they have their limitations and so the example that i used in the presentation makuto um sort of illustrates how when we think of something like creator like who created this well if we Dublin core is based on western standards and so 
for someone with a Western culture, it's like the person who actually made it or, or whatnot. And if you go into indigenous communities um, in North America in particular, um, creator is not just the person who made it. It's also the people involved in the labor or who might provide the knowledge or maybe where the stories that come from in explaining the importance or significance of the item or what's being made um, also has a lot of significance. And so those are cultural values that we want to um, address in, in these standards. So that's one of um, the things I'm hoping to bring as an outcome is better awareness so that we are more inclusive in archives. And um, second part of your question, what's where can this be applicable in other fields? So one of the areas that we can think about too is when we digitize, we use OCR, we scan it. Um, and if it's handwritten, we may not be able to use OCR, but um, some of the different types of handwritten um, software out there or to transcribe handwritten software. Uh, some of them don't recognize um, different types of um, uh, letters or, or um, symbols in handwriting. So if you think about Cyrillic, like again, using um, an indigenous example, um, Cree Cyrillic is, is um, quite prominent in fur trade writings. And so if we're scanning that, the software to transcribe it isn't going to identify that. Or even the um, examples that we use to train AI software to recognize things are very much based on um, our own Western values. And so even with AI, we, we need to be much more aware of that. And an example completely outside of archives is when people are doing face recognition software. The um, examples that they use are a lot of times um, not diverse enough. So if someone is not white or not European, um, even though they're looking right into the, the camera, their face is actually not even being recognized because there's no example in the software um, system to pick it up. So these are these are the things that I'm, I'm looking at um, addressing so that we can move and, and become more diverse and inclusive. Awesome, thank you very much. That was a terrific Thanks. answer. And um, I think that's an important point towards the end there, which I know a lot of people are giving lots of consideration to around the, the dangers of, of essentially passing on our biases and uh, and into into you know generation of, of of AI, which will just you know then cause more problems and 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 be even harder to unpick. That's terrific. Thank you, thank you, Laurie. And I have a it's we're one minute to the end, but I did have a question for Cardi that I wanted to 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 get in. I did want to give all of our um, speakers a chance to uh, answer some questions this afternoon. So um, we're good for time if people are happy to stick around for a few minutes and listen. To us chat and um, Carly, I was um, I was really interested because uh, I'm involved a lot in kind of product development at JISC and in um, building tools and resources for for researchers. I was wondering because you're addressing two um, two different audiences with with sorcery, the requesters and the request for fillers. What what do you see as being the main benefits to the uh, the the for fillers? the kind of archives. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, we wanted this to be a tool. Originally it was mainly for researchers, but we had to pivot as the, as the pandemic happened. And we realized there was this very expansive opportunity to make sorcery just as much of a tool for these repositories. So like I said, one of the biggest things we're offering is an analytics feature where a repository can see their number of requests, uh, the types of requests, the size, the ability to actually uh, link out through either archive space, Emeka, and Trophy, and kind of curate a reference scan quality mini archive that folks can take a look through as they go to their website. Um, it also has a, a very full dashboard where an institution can see their new in progress and completed requests and can also assign these requests to people at the repository to help keep track of that workflow. So that's some of the biggest ones. And then uh, we also wanted to alleviate the cost and time, which, you know, are very intertwined, that it takes to fully digitize something at top quality. So this would be something that is going to reduce the amount of time. It can be done on a smartphone or a scanner if they would like to, but also help repositories see if they are getting any repeated requests for uh, documents that they might want to then 
push forward in their digitization schedule if they so have it. So that's really kind of where we see sorcery being a tool. And then it'll also alleviate the inbox back and forth, the spreadsheet back and forth, the manual organization of trying to keep track of requests coming in from multiple different channels. Um, so that's really where we see it as a tool for repositories. Terrific, thank you. I love the idea of it being a sort of early warning signal for uh, for archives as to which collections they should they should prioritize. We do have a question in the Q and A from uh, Georgie Salzedo. Um, it's not. It's, it's actually it's from Molly C to all asking um, how can organizations ensure their continued commitment to community-driven initiatives and what are the challenges of community-driven approaches? Now, I think uh, all of you actually have some, um, you know, there's some element of community and um, community-driven approach to, to what you do. I throw that out to the, to the whole group, you know, um, how can we make sure this commitment, particularly which has we seen with maybe uh, um, Julia's work, has kind of and and uh, Christiane's as well, has maybe kind of been uh, given some impetus by the pandemic and by the circumstances we found ourselves in. How can we keep that uh, drive towards involving communities uh, going? I think it's about embedding it in your in your mission and your core values. Um, I mean, we've all we've all seen how. You know, the the pandemic was a really and still is a really difficult time for many people. Um, and how we can drive a sense of community even when we can't be together. Um, so I think it's kind of, in a way, it kind of took away that excuse for us that oh, like I'm my job's on social media. It's all online. There's it's hard to create a community. There's there's creative ways to do it. So I think it's just embedding it in those core values um, and and making sure it's it's part of your your daily workflow. And I, I think, you know, as far as what the challenges are for everyone, it's keeping up engagement and it's resourcing. Um, but, you know, that's that's part of the excitement, too, when when engagement does dip is trying to come up with, with the next thing that is going to you know get people excited about, in my case, about art. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I think that uh, our uh, we, we have to uh, communicate with our neighbor in Pio Cruz, in, in Rio. It's a very poor neighbor. And I think that if, if we have uh, how to communicate with them in, in schools of the, these neighbors, I think that uh, we could do a, a good job to, 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 to show our archives to these young students because they have a, a very difficult life. And I think that would be very important if they could um, uh, uh, know this, this archive that is our history, no? health history. And I think that uh, the pandemic shows that uh, it's very, uh, it's useful for them to know how uh, we fight against these uh, epidemics. We have the, 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 we have how to, to do with this. We have this knowledge there. And I think that we could uh, do a good job if, if we talk to them about this. Absolutely, thank you very much for that comment, Christiane. And um, I guess I'm, I'm struck by what Rafi said about um, involving disabled users and when answering my question that it's it's more expensive to not involve them at the beginning. And, uh, you know, I, I'm putting that through a slightly different uh, uh, prism is that there's a lot of effort involved in um, building communities and involving communities, but there's also a great deal of, of reward um, for any of the kind of projects that all of us are involved in, and um, we can get, we can all get much uh, much more reliable, much more impactful outcomes from uh, involving our audiences and and our communities uh, as soon as possible. And I think um, you know, in answer to that 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 question, I think we all have to find a way to make sure that we do continue to do that. 